second in our series on the mind of Christ. And uh, it's only a couple of weeks ago. Hopefully, uh, those of you who were here might remember that last time we looked at the problem, the problem that faces us uh, each day as we attempt to have the mind of Christ in us. This awful, selfish, destructive way of thinking that is in direct enmity with God, the carnal mind, the problem. It's what Brother Thomas calls a hideous deformity. And you, you might remember that last time we, we, uh, we looked at a number of things to do with the brain, and I just thought it might be helpful if we just spend uh, a few short minutes just refreshing ourselves with some of those things as we begin this evening. So you remember that last time we said that the brain was <coughs> physically composed of three distinct sections. The first section is this, uh, this lower part of the brain, the brain stem, and it's going to be responsible for all the instincts of self-preservation. So things like aggression, dominance, uh, making sure we have enough to eat when we feel hungry, controlling our temperature, our mating, our reproduction, exploration, and territory. It's to do with feeding and fighting and fleeing and mating. It's the instinctive part of the brain. And you remember that we said it's what Brother Thomas calls <coughs> the propensities in Alpha's Round. We're going to look at that in a moment. Then a little further up from this reptilian part of the brain, this lower part, right in the middle of our brain is this central part which really controls uh, our feelings and our emotions, our memories. So things like taking care of our children, caring about others. That's not really, if you like, a reptilian uh, attribute. That's something that comes from this middle part of the brain. Social cooperation. We rem you remember that we said that the brain uh, tends to connect memories with emotions. And usually it's, it's very simple. It's either an emotion of pleasure, which is then to be re-experienced, or an emotion of pain, which is to be avoided. Very simple. But it, it remembers everything, protection and learning. It's the emotional part of the brain, and it's what Brother Thomas calls the intellect. And then right across the top, we have this third part of the brain, the human brain. So we have the reptilian part at the bottom, the mammalian part in the middle, and now the human part right around the top. This is where we do our thinking, language, abstract concepts, perception, planning, logical reasoning, decision-making, foresight, hindsight, and insight. This is the analytical brain where we reason and plan and worry and invent. This is what Brother Thomas calls our moral sentiments. So really he divides or the, uh, the human brain is divided into these three parts. And uh, this theory, if you like, was put forward actually only in the 1960s and officially in a book in 1990. So quite late in the piece. But here we have it, the analytical brain, the emotional brain, and the instinctive brain. And you remember last time we talked about the way in which uh, the lower part of our brain, the instincts and the emotions, tend to hijack our thinking. This lower part of the brain is able to react a hundred times faster than our thinking brain. It's extremely quick. Two milliseconds and we can be into action. So not only does it, it react faster, but there's no, there's no delay time to it starting up. So uh, by contrast... This top part of the brain is going to take almost a second to even begin to work. And it needs a rich supply of nutrients. And then what happens is if the, if the lower part of the brain is activated, we find that it, it drains blood from the thinking part of the brain and it also sends neurochemicals to the thinking part of the brain that closes that part of the brain down. And often we find we have reacted long before we've actually thought We've just instinctively done something. And the neuroscientists scarily tell us that this happens around about almost 95% of our day. Our instincts are taking over. There's very little 
of our day is spent actually thinking. So this is our problem. We have a mind that's naturally consumed about self. Self Self-preservation, self-comfort, self-pleasure, self-enjoyment. And it takes over our thinking almost instantaneously. It's a reptilian serpent brain. It's an enmity with God. It will only respond to crucifixion and death. It's a terrible, horrible thing. And we all have one. We'd wish that it was washed away in the waters of baptism, but it is not. We have to battle with this every day. And we didn't look at this last time, but look what Brother Thomas says in Alpus Israel. Bearing in mind this is over a hundred years before neuroscience divided the brain into these three parts. The serpent had propensities and intellect, and so had the woman. But her mental constitution differed from his in having moral sentiments superadded to her propensities and intellect. By the sentiments, she was made a morally accountable being, capable of belief, able to control and direct her other faculties in their application. The propensities enable a creature to propagate its species, take care of its young, defend itself against enemies, collect food, and so forth. Intellect enables it to do these things for the gratification of its sensations. But when, in addition to these, a being is endowed with the sentiments of conscientiousness, hope, veneration, benevolence, wonder, etc., it possesses a spiritual or sentimental organization which makes it capable of reflecting, as from a mirror, the likeness and glory of God. Brother Thomas was right on a hundred years before neuroscience caught up. And tonight we want to look at this capability, as he says down the bottom, this capability of reflecting the mind of God, the spiritual mind by which God has promised that we might be able to be like him, reflect as in the mirror his likeness and glory. So tonight we want to move a little from the problem through to the promise the promise of God that we will one day have a spiritual mind. So what is a spiritual mind? Now, in our last class, we talked a lot about the physiology of the brain, and we've just gone over that very quickly, these three sections of the brain. And I hope that you didn't think from that that the carnal mind is just this kind of physiological or anatomical thing. It's this lower, horrible part of the brain. And if we concentrate on thinking more and and just just excelling in this analytical part of the brain, we can dominate, conquer, we can have victory over, we can cure the carnal mind. It is not so. It is not so. The carnal mind is not just a physiological thing. Look what Brother Thomas says again in Alpus Israel. But in the absence of the law and the testimony, the moral sentiments are as incapable of directing a man aright as though he were all intellect or all propensities. By right direction, I mean according to the mind of God. The sentiments are as blind as the propensities when intellect is unenlightened by divine revelation. The truth of this is illustrated by the excesses into which mankind is plunged in the name of religion. Mohammedanism, Romanism, paganism, and the infinite varieties of Protestantism are all the result of the co-workings of the intellect and sentiments under the impulse of the propensities. They are all the thinking of the flesh, predicated on ignorance or misconception of the truth. Hence, they are either altogether false or like the speech of the shrewd serpent, a clumsy mixture of truth and error. All parts of the human brain are carnal. All three parts are equally empty of spiritual thinking, equally useless at directing our steps. The spiritual mind is not the analytical brain. It's true that the mind of Christ when it comes into our mind, cannot inhabit any other part of our brain, that when it's developed, it lives in our thinking 
in our thinking brain, but see the important part of what Brother Thomas has to say. It's all about the law and the testimony. It's about being enlightened by divine revelation, having the mind of God. It's, it's all about God inhabiting our thinking brain. And it's only the combination of both of these that can have victory over the carnal mind. Now I'd like to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 as we begin tonight because we said we would do that as we, <clears throat> as we look at this promise of God right from the beginning of the foundation of the world. And we want to just examine what actually happened in the temptation in the Garden of Eden very quickly again. <clears throat> Look what it says in Genesis 3, and reading just a few verses from the start of the chapter. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Now, I just want to look firstly at this process of what's going on here in Genesis 3. Firstly, a changed way of thinking always begins with a question. It's there at the end of verse 1. Hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the serpent introduces doubt. You see, Eve was going to say in verse in verse 3, God hath said. But that's not what the serpent says. The serpent says, hath God said? He introduces <coughs> doubt into, into the mind of Eve. A changed way of thinking is always going to begin with a question. And then look what the serpent did. Consider the three parts of the brain for a moment. We have the instinctive brain at the bottom, and we could probably fairly easily say, if we were to uh, put um, another word to that, that that is going to describe our lusts. It's what we instinctively do. We have the emotional part of the brain, um, and here that's going to be descriptive of fear. And lastly, the analytical part of the brain, which is love. Now I want you to see what, what the serpent does in the garden because there's an order to these three, these three faculties. Firstly, in verse 4, the serpent says, Ye shall not surely die. And he's going to remove fear from the mind of Eve. Ye shall not surely die. Probably the serpent is chewing on the fruit himself. He was not a morally accountable being. He was not morally accountable to God's law. And perhaps he's entwined around the branches of the tree, nibbling on the fruit to demonstrate. You will not die, Eve. And suddenly there's doubt in Eve's mind. Don't be afraid, he says. It's not as you thought. It's not as bad as you thought. And then in verse 5... He's going to remove Eve's love for God. God doesn't actually want you to be equal to him. He's not actually telling you everything. He's deceiving you to keep you in your place. He's not to be trusted, Eve. Go on. You know you want to. And suddenly now, in the mind of Eve, 
in these three parts of her brain, she has been deceived. The serpent has removed from her the problem of fear, the emotional part of her brain, and removed this part, her love of God, the way in which she she trusts God and loves Him, wants to follow and be obedient. And once those two things were removed, Eve was open to fall victim to lust, the carnal mind. And she ate, and Adam ate as well. So really what's happening in Genesis 3 is that Eve is losing her trust for God. And so we learn that the carnal mind really is all about not trusting God. Isn't it? Right from the beginning of time. The carnal mind is really when we lose our fear and love of God and we give in to our own lusts. (coughs) It's an absence or a loss of faith. Consider these two sayings which we know from the New Testament. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Without faith, impossible to please God. Romans 8 verse 8. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. It's exactly the same. Those that be in the flesh and those that don't have faith are one and the same person. Unable to please God. So the thinking of the flesh is really when we boil it down all about not having faith in God. And so by conclusion, we would, we would say that the thinking of the spirit, the spiritual mind, is all about the possession of faith. It's all about putting back our faith, our love, our trust in God. It's all about him. That's coming out of Genesis chapter 3. But before we get to this, let's just look at the result of the fall. Sin brought what we know from the New Testament as a defiled conscience. And it's in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10. Look what it says. Yahweh Elohim called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And Adam said, verse 10, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. I was afraid, because I was naked, and so I hid myself. And an evil conscience, the carnal mind, will always be characterized by these three things. Fear, shame, and concealment. We know that to be true, don't we, from our own lives, from our children and their lives. Fear, shame, and concealment. Where these things are, when we feel these things, and we know when we feel them, brothers and sisters, that's the carnal mind. That's a defiled conscience. That's not God's promise or his will for us. That's what we've brought about on ourselves. This is the inevitable result of the carnal mind. Again, this is what Brother Thomas says in in Alpha's Israel. The reader, by contemplating Adam and Eve in their innocency, and afterwards in their guilt, will perceive in the facts of their case the nature of a good conscience and of an evil one. When they rejoiced in the answer of a good conscience, they were destitute of shame and fear. They could stand naked in God's presence, unabashed. And instead of trembling at his voice, they rejoiced to hear it as the harbinger of good things. They were then pure and undefiled, being devoid of all conscience of sin. But mark the change that afterward came over them. When they lost their good conscience, terror seized upon them at the voice of God. And shame possessed their souls, and they sought to get out of his sight and to remove as far from him as possible. Now, what was the cause of this? There is but one answer that can be given, and that is sin. And so entered the carnal mind into the history of the world. It was not just, if you like, the victory of the lower part of the brain, temporarily usurping authority over the upper part of the brain. It was a morally defiled 
and corrupt conscience. That's a much bigger problem. So what was the answer? Well, the answer is extremely simple and extremely obvious. Brother Thomas goes on to say this. Understanding then that sin or the transgression of God's law evinced by doubts, fears, and shamefacedness is the morbid principle of an evil conscience, what is the obvious indication to be fulfilled in its removal? The answer is blot out the sin and the conscience of the patient will be cured. The morbid phenomena will disappear and the answer of a good conscience will remain. If sin brings an evil conscience or the carnal mind, then forgiveness by God can only have one result, a good conscience and a spiritual mind. It was simple. It's so simple. There's nothing complicated about it at all. But the only problem was that forgiveness could only be brought about in God's righteousness by an undefiled, perfect sacrifice. A man, a man or a mind that had never sinned, never given in to the thinking of the flesh. And the story of the scriptures is really all about the search for that man. God's solution to an evil conscience was extremely simple. Forgive. But this perfect sacrifice to bring that forgiveness was not easy to find. So allow me to introduce to you a number of prophecies through the Old Testament, which are really all saying the same thing. They're called the no man prophecies. This is not an exhaustive list, but it's an indication that from the beginning of time throughout the scriptures, there's this endless pursuit by individuals and by God to find one man who might take away sin. One man who might stand in the breach. But every time anybody looked, there was no man. Look what Moses says in Exodus 2 when he's looking for deliverance for the nation of Israel. He saw that there was no man. He was looking for a deliverer, a messiah. This is what David says in the cave. No man that would know me. No man cared for my soul. Isaiah 41 speaks about there being no man, no counselor. Isaiah 50, there was no man. I looked and there was none to answer. Isaiah 59, there was no man, no intercessor. First of Corinthians 2, we just looked at this tonight. The things of God knoweth no man. What about Revelation 5? No man could open the book right through the scriptures. There are all of these no man prophecies because there wasn't anybody. There wasn't a deliverer. There wasn't anybody who could be that perfect sacrifice to take away the defilement of the evil conscience until Christ. He was the deliverer that Moses and David looked for. Isaiah 41 is going to say, I looked and there was no man, and go straight on to Isaiah 42 and describe our Lord Jesus Christ in the servant songs. Exactly the same in, in Isaiah 50. Verse 3 begins the servant song. Exactly the same in Isaiah 59. We have the mind of Christ, it says in 1 Corinthians 2. And although no man could open the book in Revelation, it was going to be the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ is that man. And here in the missing reference, we want to just have a little look at one little section of the scriptures where this idea is just blown up for us so that we can see exactly the lesson. It's in Mark chapter 5 and the story of Legion. And we're told there that no man could tame him. So let's come to Mark chapter 5 because it's really the story of a very insightful parable 
of the way our Lord dealt, deals with, and will one day replace the carnal mind. Now we know this story pretty well, but I just want to share a few things with you and, and highlight a few things from the start of this chapter. Because Mark chapter 5, when you see it through the eyes of a defiled conscience, this detailed description of legion in the first few verses is actually a perfect demonstration of the carnal mind. Look what we read about legion. The very first thing we're told in verse 2, when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him one out of the tombs. The very first information that we get about legion is that he's associated with death, graves, dead bodies. Literally, the word tombs is the Greek word memorials or burial monuments. He's living in the past, this man. There's no present. There's no future. He's surrounded by. He's intimately related with. In fact, in verse 3, he's living amongst death. The second thing we find out about this man is that he's got an unclean spirit at the end of verse 2. It's the Greek word akathato. It means without purity. He's defiled. Literally is the meaning of the word. This is the carnal mind. It's impure, unclean. We find in verse 3, no man could bind him. He's unrestrainable. Even chains could not keep this man in check. There's absolutely no restraint. He's uncontrollable. This is the carnal mind, brothers and sisters. Sometimes we find in verse 4 that the lid goes on for a time and and, and he's chained up with fetters, but then they're broken off and he he breaks free. We find in the second part of verse 4, neither could any man tame him. It's a little different to what we just read in verse 3 about binding him. It was true that he could not be bound. It was also true that he could not be tamed. And the word tame is the Greek word demazo, which is the word from which we get domesticate from. He could not be domesticated. Nobody could could rehabilitate this man back into society. This is the carnal mind. We find in verse 5 that always... Night and day he's in the mountains and we get the sense that there's no relief. It's always, no break, night and day. This man is afflicted, tormented, as we read in verse 7. He cannot escape his condition. He carries it with him in his head. We're told in verse 5 that he's in the mountains. And you might remember from our description of the carnal mind in our last class, that the very first attribute that we looked at about the carnal mind was that it alienates us from God, from life, from others. We're isolated, alienated, we're told. Ephesians 4 verse 18. Colossians 1 verse 21. Alienated. Ezekiel 23 verse 17. Alienated in your minds. It's one of the big things about the carnal mind. That we're by ourselves. Here he is. He's in the mountains. He can't be domesticated. He can't be bound. He's banished, isolated from everyone else. He's lonely. He's alone. This is what the carnal mind does to us. Again, in verse 5, he's in the tombs. That's the third time, isn't it, that we're told. He's associated with death, death, death. This is the carnal mind. And he's crying out. Verse 5, he's desperate for a solution. He knows his plight is horrible, but what can he do? He's cutting himself with stones. He's hurting himself. Who does this, brothers and sisters? Who does this? But the carnal mind. Just like the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. This is irrational, unreasonable, destructive, hurtful behavior. This is what the carnal mind does. Cutting himself with stones. Luke chapter 8 in verse 27 adds, He was naked. He's uncovered. He's clearly mad and deranged. We're told in, in Matthew 8 verse 28 that he was fierce. 
He's hostile. He's angry. He wants to fight. He's going to defend his territory, defend his cave. He's combative. He's dangerous. This is the reptilian brain in action, all about self-preservation. And look what it says in verse 6. He sees Jesus afar off. He knows that he's separated from godly things. He's not close to Jesus Christ. He's a long way away. And when he sees Jesus, he runs up, obviously distressed, in verse 7. And he cries with a loud voice, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. He admits in verse 7 that he has absolutely nothing in common with Jesus Christ. They are poles apart, completely different. This is the carnal mind coming face to face with the mind of Christ. There is absolutely no common ground. It's a pretty, a pretty apt description of our natural way of thinking, isn't it, brothers and sisters? The plight of legion. But you see, as, as deranged and as horrific and as tormented as he was, it seems pretty obvious from the record, at least in my opinion, that Legion had probably watched from his mountain cave the unbelievable miracle of the stilling of the storm at the end of Mark chapter 4. And he knew when he looked out of his cave across the Lake of Galilee and it was like, it was, it was like a cauldron and instantaneously it was like a mill pond and a man emerged from that lake and walked up towards him and this man knew that there was something incredibly powerful about this man Jesus Christ he had watched as we read in Mark chapter 4 in verse 37 a great storm become in verse 39 a great calm and maybe he wondered in his tortured mind, could this man, could this man calm the violent storm happening inside my own head? Do you know, we're told in Psalm 65 and verse 7, when the power of God is described, it says, God stilleth the noise of the sea. He stilleth the noise of the waves. And the tumult of the people. And maybe this this deranged schizophrenic lunatic knew that Christ was the answer. If Christ could still the waves of the storm, even the wind, verse 41, and the sea obey him, could he bring calm and peace and tranquility to his troubled mind? It certainly seems likely that Legion at least knew something because in chapter 5 and verse 6 he did, he did what all of us with the carnal mind need to do when he saw Jesus afar off he ran and worshipped him he prostrated himself he knew didn't he in his own heart that he was in the words of Ephesians 2 verse 12 afar off But he desperately wanted to be nigh. He wanted to be close. He knew that he he needed Jesus Christ. He wanted to be accepted by him. He knew the solution was not in himself. He knew that he desperately needed Christ. Do you know, I find it interesting in this story that it's very easy for us to look at Legion and, and to say, well, clearly that's, a very clear type of the carnal mind. And look how horrific it is. Look how horrible it is. He's powerless to help or save himself. And it was so obvious, wasn't it? He was cutting himself. He was naked. He's irrational. He's unclean. He can't be rehabilitated. No one can help him. No human help could relieve this man's suffering. But look at chapter 4 in verse 38. He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on the pillow. 
And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And in the storm, we find that in just the previous story, the disciples were just as powerless to save themselves as Legion was. And in the story after Legion, we find in chapter 5 and verse 26 that this woman with the issue of blood had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had on them and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse. And this woman was powerless to cure herself. We're all the same brothers and sisters. It was just more obvious with Legion, wasn't it? He's cutting himself. He's crying amongst the graves. But the disciples, well, they're they're perfectly sane and respectable. But all of them, disciples, legion, and the woman, were really just as helpless as each other to conquer the carnal mind. It was just more obvious with Legion. We all desperately need Christ. And so he throws himself at Christ's feet. And what does Christ do? We read in verse 13. And forthwith, Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. He takes the problem. The animal reptilian mind, and he gives it to the animals. That's how Christ solves this problem. And what did it produce? Instantaneous death. They ran down into the sea and were choked. He put the carnal mind to death. It wasn't cured, it wasn't changed. It wasn't rehabilitated. It wasn't fixed. It was drowned. And Legion had all the hallmarks, brothers and sisters, of what we have. The carnal mind. An evil or defiled conscience. And what did Brother Thomas say? The obvious indication was, blot out the sin. Forgive and the conscience of the patient will be cured. And he took all of Legion's sins, and in the words of Micah chapter 7, verse 19, he cast them into the depths of the sea. Legion was forgiven, brothers and sisters. All of the things of the carnal mind were cast into the depths of the sea. That's the language of forgiveness. Literally, drowned. And Legion was free. And look at the result. Verse 15. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the demon and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. This is the solution, brothers and sisters, to the defiled conscience of Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10. Adam was afraid because he was naked and he hid himself. Fear, shame, and defilement. And now in Mark chapter 5 and verse 15, we have the reversal of Genesis 3. He's sitting. He's not trying to hide. He's not trying to run. He's sitting. He's got openness, confidence before God. He's clothed. He's covered. There's no shame. And lastly, he's in his right mind. Fear has gone. He's got calm, peace. This is the replacement of the carnal mind, an evil conscience with a good conscience. It's what James chapter 3 says. An evil conscience is earthly sensual, devilish, confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that comes from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. And it was only the power of this one man, the one man that the world had been searching for, 
the power of Christ that could take an evil conscience and turn it into a good conscience. It was only the power of Christ that could forgive, free, release legion from sin and from his old way of life. It was the power of Christ that was going to reverse the curse of Genesis chapter 3 verse 10. And now Christ was going to replace it with confidence, peace, and a right mind. And how did it come? Look at verse 19. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. This was Christ's compassion. He understands us, brothers and sisters. He could identify with every affliction in Legion's mind. And it's with compassion that he orchestrated a replacement. He gave Legion his mind, his right mind. And when in verse 15 the people come to see Jesus, they don't, they see Legion. Because he had put on Christ. He had changed. This is the spiritual mind. It's offered to all who would prostrate themselves at Christ's feet, desperate for help and healing and freedom. If we can't see our need, brothers and sisters, we will never be healed. And you can see that right in this story. Because Legion was transformed, was he not? He went from this horrific state to a state of calm and, and assurance before God. But look at the people who, despite the miracle, couldn't see their need. They go away, verse 15, afraid. Verse 16, ashamed about the swine. Verse 17, they want to hide themselves by pushing Christ away. Get out, go away. You see, they're unchanged. They've got all the hallmarks, haven't they, of Genesis 3, verse 10. The evil conscience. They're unaffected. Unforgiven. How thankful we ought to be, brothers and sisters, that we can come here. Not that we're any better from anybody else out there, because we all have the carnal mind. But that we can be like legion and see our need. We can see how horrific we actually are. We know that we don't look like respectable people because inside we know what we're like. How destructive our own mind and thinking is. So what's the lesson from our story tonight? We all have this hideous deformity, the carnal mind, an evil conscience. But Legion is able to show us, brothers and sisters, that this is not God's will for us. It is not God's will. Look at this. This is God's desire and promise for us. Deuteronomy 5 verse 29. Oh, that they had such a mind as this to fear me and keep my commandments that it might go well with them and with their children forever. You see, God wants us to have such a mind as this that fears him, that keeps his commandments, that wants to do what's right. That's God's desire for us. He's desperate that we have this mind, this spiritual mind, this good conscience. That's his promise for us. Look at this in Ecclesiastes 3. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's mind, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. There's something in us, brothers and sisters, isn't there? that wants to seek after eternal things. And God's put that there because he wants us to be related to eternal things. He wants our mind to be exercised on eternal things. That's his promise. That's his will for us. And lastly, Philippians 4, the peace of God which riseth above every mind, Rotherham says, shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. And whatever our natural mind might do, 
We have to have assurance that the peace of God is able to rise above our mind. Every mind. That's God's will for us. It's God's desire that we abandon our carnal minds and throw ourselves at Christ's feet. And his promise is that if we do, he will cast out our tortured, evil conscience into the depths of the sea and give us a right mind, a spiritual mind, the mind of Christ. We all have a mind that cannot be rehabilitated. And whether we're as tormented as legion or as respectable as the disciples, it needs to be replaced with a right mind. And here is a marvellous thing, brothers and sisters. We can't earn it. We can't develop it ourselves. We're the problem, aren't we? We're not the solution. We're the problem. Remember, uh, the whole history of the world is searching for the one man who has the answer, and there's no man, no man, no man. None of us have the answer. We're the problem. We're not the solution. We can't get it by study or hard work, although these things are necessary. It is quite simply a gift. This is what Brother Thomas says. The reason why he will not permit men to prescribe for their own moral evils is that he is the physician. They, the lepers. He, their sovereign. They, the rebels against his law. It is his prerogative and his alone to dictate the terms of reconciliation. Man has offended God. It becomes him, therefore, to surrender unconditionally. And with the humility and teachableness of a child to receive with an open heart and grateful feelings whatever in the wisdom and justice and benevolence of God he may condescend to prescribe. The mind of Christ, the spiritual mind, is a gift. Sitting, clothed, And in his right mind was a gift from the Son of God, received by legion, refused by others. Come to our reading in in 1 Corinthians in chapter 2. Just see how clear this idea is when we're talking about the spiritual mind. Let's just read a few verses again from 1 Corinthians 2. Maybe starting at verse 10. Look how passive we are. We we do nothing, brothers and sisters, in this process. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so... The things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. It's all about receiving God's gift. It's the difference between death or life and peace, whether we receive this gift Look what look at this, just a couple of references about about this idea of receiving. James one Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. There's a group of people, isn't there, brothers and sisters, who do nothing else but just receive the engrafted word. 
and are saved. That's the criteria of salvation, not to really even do anything in the big scheme of things. Just receive the word of God and be changed. Have a spiritual mind. It's God's gift. It's his promise. But then there's other people. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 10. The thinking of, of the serpent and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. You see, salvation is all about receiving the truth, the engrafted word. And everyone will be divided into the seed of the woman, those who receive, and the seed of the serpent, those who do not receive what God has graciously offered. I'd like you to come in conclusion to Hebrews chapter 8, because this is a wonderful passage about the mind. And we're told this very special thing in Hebrews chapter 8. Paul's talking about the new covenant and how God was prepared to go further than he did with the law of Moses, where he sacrificed Pharaoh's son and wrote the law on tables of stone. Now he says, no, I'll sacrifice my son, my only begotten son, and write the law in their hearts. And look what we read in Romans 8 and verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. But look what it says in the margin. I will give my laws into their heart. It's a gift. It's a gift. You know, it's just what Brother Paul was talking about on Sunday morning about the Levites. You think about this from the Old Testament. The Levites were taken by God and given as a gift to the nation. And what were they? the spiritual mind of the nation. Right in the middle of the camp, the spiritual mind of the nation was the Levites and priests, and God gave them as a gift. It's exactly the same. This is God's promise, brothers and sisters, to give us a spiritual mind, to give his law into our minds as his gift, to share with us the mind of his son. What an amazing thing. How grateful ought we to be that God has the answer to the carnal mind, to this evil conscience. He's got the solution. It's his desire to, to see us all sitting, clothed, and in our right minds. All we have to do, brothers and sisters, is to throw ourselves at our Lord's feet and ask him to forgive our foolish ways to make us humble and willing enough to receive this gift. It's not a gift bestowed in a moment of time. It's a journey, a process from being born with a carnal mind, but striving more and more each day towards God's promise for us. It's a lifelong journey towards a spiritual mind. So what is this new mind? What does it look like? By what process does God freely give it to us? Well, God willing, that will be our next class. The renewing of our minds.